So as Kelly mentioned, we as discussants were asked to present some findings or some highlights of our research or of our classroom practice with connection back to what the panel had said. And if you're taking a look at the slide or you just heard what Eric said, plant biology, and you're thinking, that doesn't seem right, you are a keen observer. I am not a psychologist. Um, my PhD happens to be in plant physiological ecology, although my mother, when she's telling her friends what her daughter does for a living, has been known to say that I'm a plant psychologist. Um, <laughs> that's not true. Uh, I now belong to a category of researchers that are called discipline-based education researchers. So that's DEBER for short. And if that's a term that's new for you um, and you are curious or want to know more about it after we've had a moment to chat about it, then I urge you to go online to the National Academies Press and find the National Research Council report, which is called DEBER, which gives you an overview of what this field is, where we come from, and what we do. What you'll find on the first page of the primary text is a, a summary of some of the kinds of questions that deeper researchers ask. So you'll see some uh, similarities in here, maybe some things, ideas that map onto things that we've talked about here. We're interested in things like how students learn concepts and practices and ways of thinking that represent uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. We're interested in identifying and measuring learning objectives and instructional approaches. So what's appropriate for learning in a particular disciplinary context and how do we measure efficacy of instructional approaches? The second bullet is interest in uh, research and how students develop expertise within disciplines. So in addition to that, many of us are also interested in how do we find practices and engage our students in ways of thinking, knowing, um, practicing their knowledge so that they can become active participants and broaden the representation of individuals in STEM fields. Uh, if there's a, a most important bullet here that is relevant for our context today, it's the last one. And that is that our role also as, re as deeper researchers is to translate research findings that come from fields like cognitive science and psychology into classroom practice. So how do we take what we've learned from the literature, what the literature has to say, what these re wonderful researchers are telling us today about how people learn, and incorporate those principles into how we design instruction and ask our own questions about that. So the thing that's, uh, the flavor that's a little bit different that makes us a deeper researcher is coming from the disciplinary expertise. So we're asking all of these questions like other learning sciences researchers would, but from the specific lens of our interest within a particular disciplinary field. So one of the um, interesting things, so among all of these the discussions of Deber, there's a lot of conversation about what's important and what are the appropriate learning targets and what should we be doing in classrooms to make students better prepared for science. And overwhelmingly, the consensus and the convergence of the opinions, regardless of what STEM field we're coming from, is that if we really want students to learn science, we need to have them doing the things that scientists do. So that means science learning needs to reflect science practice. So there's a lot of consensus now on thinking about how do we get students to engage in practices in the context of learning science at the college level. And we can debate about what those practices ought to be and what is appropriate for one discipline versus another. But as a start, there's another document that you can also get free online, also from the National Academies Press, that's called Vision and Change, that at least puts out a hypothesis, or at least a starting place for us to begin engaging that discussion about what might some of those practices actually be. So they provide a list here. I don't think most of us would find these two necessarily egregious. We have general agreement on these. We want students to think about science process, be able to do it, reason quantitatively, um, use modeling and representations in their thinking, and think across disciplines and about the application of their science to societal problems. So in 2008-2009, um, myself and a group of collaborators started thinking about this, this kind of notion and that, yes, indeed, that did precede the publication of Vision and Change, but these thoughts have been around for a long time. And we took this thinking about how do you design instruction that puts a highlight on practices. And we redesigned an introductory biology course where the centerpiece of the instruction, all the things that the students would do in the classroom were organized around science practices. So when you first think about this, and by the way, I teach you know, hundreds of students, and, and those of us who teach at the introductory level generally do, you can't bring petri dishes and microscopes into that kind of context. So as was mentioned here, it's about the cognitive practices. What things do scientists do, and how do they represent their thinking? 
So we converged on an instructional model that uses the following practices. We use models and, and uh, modeling, the practice of modeling. Uh, argumentation, so can students construct and build claims? Can they defend them with evidence? And how do they use data? So we have students collecting data, representing it in the form of graphs, and interpreting the meaning of that data. So our acronym is MAD Biology. We teach MAD Biology. And we have a fourth practice that kind of intersects all of those, where we ask students to develop skills in narrative ability. Because for each of these practices, they have to explain their thinking. And that's in the form of using words. So they have to be able to evaluate and explain, and that comes for their ability to use language. So if we're teaching those practices, and we've got students doing them in the classroom, that also means that we have to assess them accordingly. So it does mean abandoning some of the traditional models for how we assess students. We have to move away from, um, we know that assessment is the thing that drives students' thinking and how they study and how they prepare. Uh, so we're purposefully embedding those kinds of practices into the assessment strategy for these courses. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about my research, and it will be just a little bit and specifically to reflect back onto the panels. And when I was initially asked to do this, I said, absolutely not. Did you see who we were asking to come to this panel? <laughs> That's crazy. These are really amazing people in this field. Um, but as I had a chance to absorb what the speakers were saying, I think I might be able to pull this off, so let's give it a shot. So I'm going to highlight one set of one question that we're pursuing, talk a little bit about what we're finding, and I'm going to make a lame attempt to try to connect to the things that I heard today, so you can decide if you buy it or not. So I'm specifically interested, in, I'm going to go back one, in this practice, the modeling. So as we started doing this in the class, I became increasingly interested in how not only students were using representations, but how they were building them as ways to communicate their thinking. So I started seeing interesting trends and patterns. And my specific research interest in one of the lines of this kind of research is I care very much about how students integrate their understanding of genetics and, e and evolution. So the topic domains for my course are genetics, evolution, and ecology. And in the traditional paradigm, the way that the class is normally taught, you get a big bag of genetics. And then when you're done with that unit, you take an exam and you flush all of that information out of your system so that you can go into evolution. But those of us who do biology know that genetics and evolution are the same thing. You cannot understand how evolution works absent your understanding of genetics. So it's great that you have an understanding of what a gene is when you're doing that unit. In that version, it's this subcellular entity. It's made of pieces and particles. And then when we move to evolution, it feels like students have completely lost that conception of what genes are, and now they're these artifacts or these, these traits of organisms, and there's no glue that holds these two conceptions together. So my mission is to find a way to help ameliorate some of that problem and some of that difficulty in learning. So the question that I'm going to talk about just very briefly is uh, we started embedding this as, a, a, as I said, a practice. So what we do in the classroom is that when we begin the class, students begin representing their thinking about how genetics concepts relate to one another as they understand them at that time. As we progress through the course and we learn more genetics and we learn more evolution, they start bringing in those concepts. And so the models, the way that they represent their thinking through these models expands. So they add more concepts. So that means early in the semester, the models are fairly simple. And I've got an example of an early semester model on top and a late semester model on the bottom. So you can see that there's a lot of expansion here. And there's a lot of change in the nuance and the use of language. So what does this look like in the classroom? We do a lot of models. And it's always kind of with the same purpose. It's always integrating these concepts. But every time we do it, we ask the students to contextualize this model to a different case. So they get lots of cases. Sometimes we're modeling genetic outcomes in populations of plants. In other cases, it's something going on with fish. In some cases, it's what's happening with the wolves on Isle Royale. So there's a lot of change in the contextual features of this approach. And my question was, how do we quantify the change in these patterns over time? So we know that there's a big difference, but how do we quantify that? And that's where we, kind of my disciplinary science is, is I want a number. I want to stamp a number on that. So um, we thought about some possible hypotheses. How do we explain this? Um, and we chose two metrics, correctness 
So how well are students using the technical language of biology to explain their thinking, as well as the com complexity, which we define as an interconnectedness of the model itself. And I won't talk about the specific methods. But our hypothesis is that one, one possibility is that students would increase in both metrics over time. So that would be representative of their accreting new knowledge and forging new and uh, additional connections. Another possibility is that they start at a higher level of correctness and, uh, excuse me, a higher level of both correctness and complexity, and both metrics decline over time, so follow the direction of the arrow. And that would be an indicator of regression. So they start off strong, and then it kind of bleeds away. And we know that that's what happens over time if things are not completely revisited frequently. Another option um, is something Andy Anderson here calls procedural display, which is uh, you know that you're supposed to do something, you're supposed to add a lot of stuff, but you don't really understand how it all fits, so you just throw a bunch of stuff on the paper, and that would, we call that shotgunning, right? You just dump a bunch of stuff and hope something sticks. And a uh, final option is that um, the students would go through a process of pruning or developing more parsimonious models. So correctness would continue to increase, but complexity might be reduced as they start finding out and thinking about what connections are relevant and meaningful and which ones are not helpful for explaining a system. Okay, so this is what we actually saw, right? These are the trajectories for individual students, 591 students, and that's the pattern that we saw. But let me collapse that for you into trends that are meaningful. And here we've got students separated out by achievement triatiles at the time that they enter the class. So we were looking at how low performing students entering the class were performing on this kind of assessment versus high achieving students. So the short story is that all three achievement triatiles follow the same basic pattern. So they're all getting better over time in terms of correctness. And there's an initial increase from early in the semester to about midterm in terms of the complexity of their models. But from the midterm to about the final, we start seeing a shift. Correctness continues to increase, but not as steep a slope, and complexity starts to decline. So that suggests the hypothesis of parsimony, that over time students are building more parsimonious models. The other finding that I want to highlight here is that when we begin this, we see a lot more spread among the tritiles in their ability to use this particular type of assessment and re represent their thinking that way. But by the end, we have non-statistical differences among the tritiles. So that means these lower performers and mid-performers are actually coming within line of the higher achievers in the student, in the, in the population. Okay, so I said I would try to connect, right? Okay, so Dr. Rodinger said that we need to assess frequently, that we need to test frequently. Well, these models, the students get hammered with these models frequently, both in class and on exams and quizzes. Our assessment strategy incorporates three exams, six, six, four to six quizzes, a quiz is a half an exam, and on every one they're doing a different version of the model, and it's always to a different case. So this is something they have to do over and over again. So to... Dr. Gentner's point about analogic reasoning and structure mapping, what we're aiming for is that as students progress through this, that they're starting to see the deep underlying features of the system and be able to map these onto different cases. So I'm always very happy when the students ask me at the end, why do you have us doing the same thing over and over again? I say, yay, because those that don't get this say, I know we have to build models all the time, but I never know what it's gonna be, so I don't know how to do it which means that they're not thinking deeply about the relationships. And to um, Dr. Richland's point about thinking like systems and representing our thinking in the way that scientists do, this definitely is coming, it's derived entirely from a systems thinking approach. So that's exactly the kind of framework of, of thinking that's going into our design of this pedagogy. And it's not electronic yet. We don't have the technology. <laughs> However, there are electronic tools and that's something that we're exploring but our definition of a conceptual model derives entirely from artificial intelligence. So, there you go. Okay, and I'm just gonna close, <laughs> I'll close with this slide to let you know that there are resources on campus for folks that want to learn to become better teachers and for individuals who wanna connect with folks that do deeper research. I am certainly not the only one, we have folks in all the departments here on campus, all the STEM departments. So, okay.